The air inside the fire tower smelled wrong that night, like burnt hair and spoiled meat. Though I was fifty feet above the ground, with nothing but rain and pine below me. I tried ignoring it, convincing myself it was nothing more than my imagination playing tricks after two months of isolation. But the smell clung, sour and persistent, gnawing at the edges of my mind. My name is Leo Grayson, and I'd been working as a fire lookout in Montana's wilderness for just over a year. It was the kind of job people either dreamed of or couldn't understand. Weeks spent alone in a wooden tower high above the treetops, scanning for smoke. It was perfect for someone like me. A few years ago, I was a park ranger in Glacier National Park. I loved the work, the rugged landscapes, the, the freedom, the challenge. But when my wife passed, something in me fractured. I couldn't face the people, the noise, or even the smallest reminders of her. So I left, took the first posting I could find that promised solitude, and I've been here ever since, perched in this swaying tower miles from anything resembling civilization. At first I embraced the silence. The endless expanse of pine and fir felt like a refuge, a place where I could disappear into the rhythm of nature. But this summer was different. The forest had grown quiet, not peaceful, but oppressive. The birdsong had thinned, and even the wind seemed hesitant to move through the trees. And then there was the storm. That night, the sky boiled with dark clouds, and lightning flickered on the horizon like a warning. The rain began in bursts, slamming against the tower's glass and drowning out the faint hum of my radio. Normally, I found storms comforting, a reminder of how small I was compared to the forces of nature. But not this one. This one felt alive, like it had its own cruel intentions. I grabbed my binoculars and scanned the forest below, the lightning illuminated the landscape in jagged flashes, and for a moment I thought I saw something moving through the trees. A figure, maybe. A shadow, taller and thinner than it should have been. When the next flash came, the figure was gone. I shook my head, laughing at myself under my breath. Too much coffee, too many nights spent staring into the dark. Still, I couldn't shake the unease, the way the shadows seemed thicker than they had any right to be. The radio crackled, startling me. I turned the dial, trying to clear the static, when a voice broke through. Aleo, are you there? It was Ben, a lookout stationed twenty miles east. He didn't sound like himself. His voice was shaking, edged with something raw. Fear. I'm here. I said, trying to sound calm. What's going on? There was a pause, broken only by the hiss of static. Uh, then... Something's out there. I... He stopped, his breath hitching. I saw it, Leo. It's circling my tower. Tall. Pale. Claws. Another pause. A sound I couldn't place came through the radio. Halfway between a laugh and a growl, faint but unmistakable. Ben, I said, gripping the receiver tightly. What the hell are you talking about? It's not human, he whispered. And it knows I'm here. Then the radio went dead. The storm pressed down on the tower like a living thing, battering the walls with unrelenting force. The rain hit the windows in bursts, streaking them so thickly that the forest below became little more than a smear of black and gray. Lightning cracked, illuminating the world in strobe-like flashes, and for an instant the trees seemed to twist unnaturally, their branches reaching like clawed hands. 
I gripped the edge of the table, trying to steady myself as the tower swayed with each gust of wind. The air inside was stifling, heavy with that same sickly smell that I couldn't seem to escape. Outside, the storm roared, but beneath it, I swore I could hear something else, faint whispers, just below the edge of hearing. I tried the radio again, turning the dials in frustration. Ben, come in, I said, my voice sharper than I intended. Static answered me, interspersed with bursts of faint crackling, almost like breathing. <laughs> my heart raced as I scanned the treetops again with my binoculars. The lightning threw the forest into brief, uh, violent clarity. And for the second time that night, I thought I saw movement, uh, a figure darting between the trunks, impossibly fast. Come on, Leo, get a grip, I muttered to myself, setting the binoculars down. But the storm seemed to close in tighter, the rain hammering harder, the air growing colder. Then the trap door below me rattled. At first, I thought it was the wind. But the sound came again, heavier this time. I froze, staring at the hatch that led to the base of the tower. My hand instinctively went to the axe propped against the wall. Leo, you're there. I jumped, the sudden voice on the radio cutting through the tension. It wasn't Ben, it was Todd a friend of mine and the supervisor for our lookout district. He wasn't stationed in a tower, but managed the team from the main ranger station miles away. I'm here, I said, relief flooding my chest. Todd, something's wrong. Ben called me earlier. He said he saw something at his tower, and now the hatch. <sighs> Slow down, Todd interrupted, his voice calm but firm. You're getting spooked, that's all. I'm heading out to check on Ben now. Stay put, okay? I hesitated the radio press to my ear. You're driving in this storm? Todd, it's not safe. <laughs> he chuckled a low, dry sound. I'll be fine. You know how these storms go always worse from up in the tower. Sit tight, Leo. I'll radio when I reach him. The line went dead before I could respond. The trapdoor rattled again. This time it wasn't the wind. I grabbed the axe and edged closer, my boots creaking against the wooden floor. My breath came in shallow bursts as I stared at the hatch, willing it to stay closed. The sound came again, scraping now, like nails dragging against the wood. Hello? I called, my voice shaking. The scraping stopped. I backed away, my grip tightening on the axe. For what felt like hours, I stood there, listening to the storm rage outside, waiting for the hatch to move again. But nothing happened. When I finally lowered the axe, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, a faint glow coming from the forest below. I stepped to the window, my stomach churning as I realized what I was seeing. It was Ben's tower. Even through the storm, I could see its light flickering, erratic and dim. That shouldn't have been possible, not from twenty miles away, not in weather like this. But there it was, glowing faintly through the downpour, a silent beacon in the darkness. And then, just as quickly, it went out. The storm's fury hadn't relented, but the sound beneath it, the scraping, whispering, breathing, had grown louder, clawing at my nerves. I tried to convince myself it was all in my head, but when I checked the trap door again, my stomach dropped. Claw marks. Fresh gouges ran across the wood, deep enough to splinter the boards. Whatever had been rattling the hatch wasn't the wind. I backed away, my hands trembling around the axe handle. Before I could process it, the radio hissed to life again, 
Leo, come in. Todd's voice crackled, faint and uneven. Todd? Is Ben with you? I blurted, rushing to the radio. There was a long pause, punctuated by bursts of static. Finally, Todd spoke again. But his tone was different. Now it was slow, deliberate. You need to leave the tower. What? I froze. Todd, I can't... What's going on? <laughs> the radio crackled again, and his next word sent a chill down my spine. It's not me. The line went dead. I stumbled back, nearly dropping the radio. The voice hadn't sounded quite like Todd's. Not exactly. It was close, but uh, there was a slight distortion, as if it was being played back on a broken record. I barely had time to process the implication when the hat shuddered violently. Something was down there, and it wasn't trying to hide anymore. Leo! A voice called from below. I froze. It was Todd's voice, but I knew it, knew it wasn't him. He wasn't here. He couldn't be. The voice came again clearer this time. Leo, it's me. Open the door. My grip tightened on the axe, sweat slicking my palms. Prove it, I said, my voice shaking. Silence. Then the voice laughed, a low, rasping sound that didn't belong to Todd or any human I'd ever known. I staggered back from the trap door, my heart hammering in my chest. The laughter continued, rising and falling in unnatural waves, echoing through the tiny space. Desperation clawed at me. I snatched the binoculars again, hoping for some sign of help and scanned the forest. The storm made it nearly impossible to see, but then I spotted it. Movement at the base of the tower. Two figures, tall and unnaturally thin, circling the structure like wolves stalking prey. Their pale skin gleamed faintly in the stormlight, and their limbs moved with a jerking, insect-like rhythm. I couldn't breathe. Leo, let me in, the voice called again, now higher pitched, almost mocking. I turned back to the hatch just in time to see it bow inward, splinters raining from the edges. Whatever was out there, whatever they were, they were coming in. Gripping the axe tightly, I shouted into the storm. Stay back, I swear to God. I'll... A sharp crack interrupted me as one of the hinges snapped, the hatch swinging open slightly. A clawed hand reached through, pale and impossibly long, its fingers curling around the edge. And then it spoke. But it wasn't Todd this time. It was my voice. Help me, Leo, it said, mimicking the exact tone and panic I'd used on the radio just minutes ago. My knees buckled as I backed into the far corner of the tower, the axe trembling in my hands. The laughter started again, this time from both figures below, overlapping and distorting like a broken symphony. I was trapped. The trap door burst open with a thunderous crash, the wood splintering as if it were paper. My body reacted before my brain caught up. I swung the axe blindly, the blade biting into empty air. The thing that climbed through wasn't human. Its skin was pallid, stretched too tight over an angular frame that seemed to fold and unfold as it moved. Its limbs were long and spider-like, the joints bending unnaturally. A faint glow radiated from its hollow eyes, like dying embers in a bottomless void. And its mouth, its mouth was too wide, filled with jagged, uneven teeth that gleamed as it smiled. It didn't attack immediately. Instead, it tilted its head, as if studying me. 
its laughter spilling out in warped, overlapping voices. Todd's, Ben's, and mine, all twisted into a grotesque parody. I swung again, this time aiming for its head. The axe connected, but instead of cutting through, it glanced off as though I'd struck stone. The creature barely flinched, but its smile faded. The laughter stopped. Then it lunged. Its clawed hand shot toward me, faster than I could react, catching me across the chest. Pain exploded through my body as its claws tore through my shirt and raked my skin. I stumbled back, crashing into the desk, my vision swimming. From the corner of my eye I saw movement below, the second creature circling the base of the tower. It climbed the stairs with an insect-like gait, its limbs clacking against the wooden steps. I was trapped. Desperation surged through me. I grabbed the radio, not knowing what I hoped to achieve, and screamed into it. Todd! Anyone! Please, help me! Oh, uh, static. Then, impossibly, a voice answered. What? It was Ben's voice, weak and distant, but unmistakable. The creature in front of me screeched its head snapping toward the radio as if it had heard it too. Taking advantage of its distraction, I shoved the desk into it with all my strength. The creature staggered, its limbs collapsing inward before it straightened again with a sickening crack. I didn't wait to see what it would do next. I grabbed the rope tied to the tower's railing, the emergency escape I'd prayed I'd never have to use, and hurled myself over the edge. The wind tore at me as I slid down, the rope burning my palms. Rain pelted my face, blinding me as the forest floor rushed up to meet me. I hit the ground hard, my knees buckling, but I didn't stop. I, I, I ran. Branches whipped against my face, and the mud sucked at my boots as I stumbled through the darkness. Behind me, I heard the laughter again, closer this time echoing through the trees. It wasn't just one voice anymore. It was a cacophony, a rising chorus of mockery and malice. I glanced over my shoulder and immediately wished I hadn't. The creatures were chasing me, their movements jerky and inhumanly fast. One leapt onto a nearby tree, its claws sinking into the bark as it scrambled after me from above. My lungs burned as I pushed myself harder, but the forest seemed to stretch endlessly, the trees closing in around me. The laughter grew louder, and then... A blur of motion slammed into me from the side. I hit the ground hard, the impact knocking the wind out of me. One of the creatures stood over me now, its hollow eyes gleaming with triumph, its claws raised high, poised to strike. A sudden flash of light cut through the darkness, blinding both of us. The creature hissed, recoiling as the beam swept over it. I turned my head, squinting against the glare, and saw Todd standing there, his flashlight in one hand and a rifle in the other. Get up, he shouted. I didn't need to be told twice. Scrambling to my feet, I ran toward him as he fired a shot into the air. The crack of the rifle echoed through the forest, momentarily drowning out the storm. The creatures hesitated, their heads twitching toward the sound. But they didn't retreat. Todd grabbed my arm, his grip iron tight, and pulled me forward. We need to move, now! We sprinted together, the creatures' laughter trailing behind us like a curse. Then one of them dropped from the trees. It landed on Todd with a bone-crunching impact, its claws slicing through him before I could react. His scream tore through the storm as he went down, blood soaking into the mud. Todd, I yelled, skidding to a halt. Go, he shouted, his voice ragged and desperate. Just go. I hesitated for a heartbeat too long. The creature's head snapped toward me its mouth curling into a grin that I knew I'd see in my nightmares for the rest of my life. Todd fired another shot, the sound jolting me into action. I turned and ran, his screams fading into the storm behind me. 
The forest seemed endless, a maze of shadows and rain. I didn't stop until the laughter faded, replaced by the deafening silence of the storm's aftermath. I don't remember how far I ran. The forest blurred around me, the rain blending with the tears streaming down my face. Ah, my chest burned, my legs ached, and every shadow felt like it was alive, reaching for me. Somehow, I found the dirt road that led to the ranger station and followed it, though I didn't stop looking over my shoulder the entire way. When I finally stumbled through the station doors, soaked and trembling, I collapsed onto the floor. They told me later that I was screaming something incoherent, laughter, claws, shadows, but I don't remember. I was the only one who came back. Todd's body was never found. Officially, the storm was blamed for his disappearance, just like they blamed it for the destruction of my tower. When they found it, the place was in ruins, claw marks carved into every wall, the trap door ripped clean off its hinges. They didn't ask too many questions, and I didn't volunteer any answers. What could I say that wouldn't make me sound insane? Till one day, I discovered the scraps of here Redding's tail. But I knew the truth. I quit the job a week later. I packed what little I had and left Montana for good, driving aimlessly for months, trying to outrun the memories. The laughter stayed with me, though, echoing in my dreams, in the hiss of static on an old motel TV, in the rustle of wind through the trees. It's been three years, and I've tried to rebuild my life. I never stay in one place for too long. I avoid forests entirely, keeping to crowded cities and wide open spaces where nothing can hide. But no matter where I go, the feeling lingers, that sense of being watched, of something waiting just beyond the edge of sight. And then there are the signs. Last month, in a cheap motel outside Denver, I turned on the TV and heard static. For a moment, I swore I heard my own voice, distorted and faint, repeating the same words I'd screamed into the radio that night. Help me. Two weeks ago, I found claw marks on the hood of my car after leaving a diner late at night. The parking lot had been empty when I got there, and no one saw anything. And then, yesterday, a package arrived at the motel where I'm staying. It didn't have a return address. Inside was a radio, the same make and model we used in the lookout towers. When I turned it on, there was only static at first, but then, beneath it, I heard laughter. It wasn't Todd's voice this time. It was mine. I don't know what they are, or why they let me live that night. Maybe they wanted me to tell their story, to spread their laughter. Or maybe they're just playing with me, waiting for the right moment to come back and finish what they started. All I know is this. I survived the fire tower, but I'll never truly escape it. Some things don't belong in this world, and once you've seen them, they never let you go. And every time I hear static, I wonder, uh, how much longer do I have? The air smelled wrong, thick, damp, and tinged with something metallic. It clung to the back of my throat like decay, making me gag before I even stepped outside. Cooper, my mountain cur, was already on the porch, his ears perked and his body tense. His growl was low and guttural, his hackles raised as he stared into the dark tree line that loomed just beyond the clearing. I didn't need to see it to know something was out there. Five years ago, I traded the buzz of the city for the solitude of the Appalachian wilderness. I'd grown tired of the grind, the constant hum of traffic, the fluorescent lights, the endless noise that never gave you a moment to think. Out here, I could breathe. 
The land was my own, untouched by anyone else's hands. My cabin, built with my own sweat and blood, stood as a testament to my desire for self-reliance. I lived off the land, hunting for food, growing what I could, and bartering with the locals when I needed supplies. For the most part, it was perfect. The days were quiet, filled with the steady rhythm of chopping wood, checking traps, and mending fences. The nights were darker than I'd ever known. With a blanket of stars so vivid, it felt like you could reach out and touch them. But lately the peace had soured. Cooper was the first to notice. Normally fearless, he'd begun sticking close to the cabin, his playful energy replaced with a nervous wariness. At first, I'd chalked it up to a passing coyote, or maybe a bear wandering too close. But then the sounds started. Strange, guttural noises that carried through the trees at night. They weren't coyotes. They weren't anything I recognized. And then, this morning, I found the deer. Its body was sprawled at the edge of my property, just where the forest began to thicken. The smell hit me first, sickly sweet and coppery, drawing flies that buzzed in a frenzied cloud. Its rib cage had been torn open, the flesh ragged and torn as if by massive claws. Bite marks, far too large for a coyote or bobcat, were gouged into its neck and legs. I crouched beside it, examining the tracks in the dirt. The prints were enormous, three-toed and clawed, pressing deep into the earth, as if whatever made them was heavy. Too heavy to climb trees, I thought, but the woods were quiet. No birds, no squirrels, just that suffocating silence. Something wasn't right. I wanted to call the sheriff, but I knew how that would go. A bear, he'd say. Or maybe a wolf, even though there hadn't been a confirmed wolf sighting in this area in decades. He'd laugh, tell me to patch up my fence, and carry on. Still, I couldn't shake the unease. I'd lived here long enough to know the rhythms of the land. This was something different. Something wrong. As the sun set and the forest sank into darkness, Koopa whined softly at my feet. His eyes dotted toward the tree line, where the shadows had grown impossibly deep. I gave him a reassuring pat, but inside I felt it too. The woods were watching. The forest smelled of damp earth and rotting leaves, a cloying wetness that seemed to seep into my skin with every breath. Mist clung to the ground in thin tendrils, weaving between the gnarled roots like pale, ghostly fingers. The air was heavy, thick with moisture, and an eerie stillness that set my nerves on edge. Every step I took cracked twigs and crunched dead leaves underfoot, the sounds too loud to be natural in the unnatural quiet. Even Cooper, my ever-vigilant shadow, seemed reluctant to press forward. His ears twitched at every faint rustle, his low whines barely audible over the pounding of my own heartbeat. I wasn't alone, though. Jake, my neighbor from about a mile down the valley, had joined me. He was a wiry man in his late forties, with a face weathered by years of hard labor and a thick salt-and-pepper beard that made him look older than he was. We'd developed a friendly camaraderie over the years, helping each other with repairs, sharing game during lean months. Jake had been born and raised in these mountains, his knowledge of the land deeper than mine, even after all my years here. Something ain't right about this, he muttered, adjusting the hunting rifle slung over his shoulder. His voice was low, barely more than a growl. You're telling me? I replied, shining my flashlight ahead into the mist. The beam barely seemed to cut through the dense haze. You ever seen tracks like those before? Jake shook his head. Ain't no bear, that's for damn sure. Whatever it is, it's big, though. Bigger than I care to meet face to face. Cooper let out a sharp bark, startling both of us. 
He was crouched low to the ground, his nose pointed toward a patch of undergrowth about twenty yards ahead. What is it, boy? I asked, my hand instinctively going to the knife on my belt. The two of us approached cautiously, pushing aside the tangled branches. That's when we saw it. A second deer carcass, mangled and half buried in leaves. This one was fresher than the first. The wounds still glistening with blood. The air was thick with the sickly sweet stench of death. But it wasn't the carcass that sent a chill down my spine. Carved into the dirt beside it, deep and deliberate, was a strange symbol, a circle with jagged lines radiating outward, almost like a sunburst. What the hell is that? Jake murmured, his face pale even in the dim light. I don't know, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. This symbol felt wrong, like it didn't belong here, like it was a warning. Jake knelt beside the symbol, running a calloused hand over the grooves. This ain't natural. Somebody made this. <laughs> Somebody? I echoed, glancing around the forest. The thought of another person lurking out here, carving cryptic symbols into the ground, was somehow more unsettling than the idea of a rogue animal. Then, from deeper in the woods, we heard it. A low, guttural growl, so deep it vibrated in my chest, it was followed by a sound like claws raking against a stone, a long, piercing screech that set my teeth on edge. Cooper bolted, tearing off toward the cabin without a second glance. Jake and I stood, frozen, staring into the blackness where the sound had come from. We need to go, Jake said finally, his voice trembling. For once, I didn't argue. The forest seemed darker than before, as if the faint light of the moon was being swallowed whole by the dense canopy. Jake and I moved quickly, our flashlights casting erratic beams over the underbrush. Every so often my beam would catch something, a branch twisted unnaturally, claw marks gouged into a tree trunk, or the glint of a reflective surface deeper in the woods. What do you think it was? I asked, my voice hushed. Jake didn't answer immediately. He kept his eyes on the path ahead, his grip tight on his rifle. Finally, he muttered, I don't think it's something we're meant to find out. I wanted to press him, but my words caught in my throat. Something about the weight of his tone felt final. We came across the first symbol about ten minutes later. It was carved into a tree this time, the same jagged sunburst design we'd seen near the deer carcass. But this one was different. The lines were deeper, more precise, as if carved by something with impossibly sharp claws. And around the base of the tree, the ground was littered with animal bones. Oh, tiny ones, like those of squirrels or birds, all cracked open and stripped bare. Ah, Jesus, I whispered, stepping back instinctively. Jake knelt to inspect the bones. He didn't touch them, but his expression was grim. It's not hunting to eat, he said after a moment. It's leaving these as, I don't know, a, a message maybe. A message to who? Jake didn't respond. Instead, he stood abruptly and gestured with his flashlight toward the path ahead. Let's keep moving. The growls started about a half an hour later. At first they were distant, almost too low to hear. But as we moved deeper into the woods they grew louder, more insistent. It wasn't the sound of any animal I'd ever heard. It was guttural, almost wet like something struggling to breathe. Tell me you know what that is, I said, trying to keep the fear out of my voice. Jake shook his head. His face was pale, his jaw set. Nope. And 
I don't want to find out. Despite his bravado, I could see the tension in his movements. He was walking faster now, his shoulders hunched, his knuckles white around the grip of his rifle. For me, the fear was sharper and more visceral. My hands were sweating, and every shadow seemed to move just out of reach of the flashlight beam. Cooper's absence was a weight in my chest. I kept expecting to hear his bark, to see him come bounding out of the darkness, but the woods were silent except for the growls. Then we found the clearing. The first thing I noticed was the smell, thick and rancid, like spoiled meat baking in the sun. My stomach turned, but I forced myself to move forward. The clearing was littered with more symbols, all carved into the dirt in a perfect circle. The sunbursts radiated outward from a central point where a single, enormous claw mark had been gouged deep into the earth. Around the edges of the clearing, the trees were twisted and blackened, as if burned. Oh, what the hell is this? I breathed. I breathed, shining my flashlight over the scene. Jake didn't answer. He was staring at something on the ground. Jake? I followed his gaze and felt my stomach drop. It was Cooper's collar, torn and smeared with blood. Um, my knees nearly gave out. I stumbled forward, grabbing the collar with shaking hands. The sight of it broke something in me. Ah, Cooper, I shouted into the woods, my voice cracking. Cooper, where are you? Gray and quiet, Jake hissed, grabbing my arm. You want to bring that thing right to us? But it was already too late. The growl came again, this time deafeningly close. The sound reverberated through the clearing, followed by the unmistakable sound of something large crashing through the underbrush. Jake raised his rifle, his hands steadied despite the fear in his eyes. Get behind me, he ordered. I hesitated torn between the urge to stand my ground and the instinct to run. But before I could decide, the thing stepped into the clearing. The flashlight beam caught it for just a moment, long enough to see pale, mottled skin stretched over a gaunt, hulking frame. Its arms were impossibly long, ending in claws that gleamed like polished bone. Its face was wrong almost human but distorted, with black pits where its eyes should have been, and a mouthful of jagged teeth. Grant, Jake said, his voice shaking now. Run. The thing moved into the clearing with a jerking, unnatural gait, its limbs bending at odd angles as it stepped forward. The sound of its movements, a wet clicking, like bone grinding on bone made my stomach churn. It... It was massive, at least seven feet tall, with skin so pale it almost glowed in the dim light of our flashlights. And its eyes, black, bottomless voids, seemed to drink in the light, pulling everything around it into their empty depths. Jake raised his rifle, his breathing shallow but steady, Stay behind me, he said again, his voice low and firm. I couldn't move. My legs felt rooted to the ground, my body frozen as if the creature's gaze had locked me in place. My heart thundered in my chest, each beat echoing in my ears like a drum. The creature tilted its head, a sickeningly slow motion, as if it were studying us. Then it opened its mouth. The scream that followed wasn't human. It wasn't animal. It was a piercing, guttural wail that made my teeth vibrate and my vision blur. It hit me like a physical force, knocking me back a step and sending every nerve in my body into overdrive. Jake fired. The shot rang out, deafening in the stillness, and hit the creature square in the chest. It stumbled back but didn't fall. Instead, it let out a snarling, guttural sound a noise that could have been pain or rage, and lunged. Bang was fast, 
too fast. Before Jake could fire again, it was on him. Its claws slashed out, catching him across the chest and sending him sprawling to the ground. His rifle skittered away into the brush. Blood sprayed into the air, a dark, glistening arc that painted the grass. Jake! I shouted, finally breaking out of my paralysis. The creature loomed over him, its claws raised for another strike. Without thinking, I grabbed a rock from the ground and hurled it at the thing with all my strength. The rock struck its head with a dull thud. It wasn't much, but it was enough to distract it. The creature snapped its head toward me, its mouth curling into something that might have been a grin if it weren't so alien, so wrong. Jake groaned trying to crawl away, but the creature's attention was fully on me now. Grant, run! Jake rasped, his voice thick with pain. But I couldn't leave him. I darted toward his rifle, my hands fumbling as I picked it up and swung it around to aim at the creature. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely line up the shot. The thing lunged. I fired. The shot hit its shoulder and it recoiled with a shriek, but it didn't stop. It came at me again. Faster this time, its claws slicing through the air just inches from my face. I stumbled backward, tripping over a root and landing hard on my back. The creature loomed over me, its breath hot and rancid as it leaned in close. Its eyes, those endless black voids, seemed to pull me in, filling my vision, my mind. My thoughts fragmented, splintering into flashes of fear and despair. And then Jake was there. He'd somehow gotten back to his feet, blood streaming down his chest. He slammed the butt of his hunting knife into the creature's side, driving it with all the strength he had left. The thing screamed again, this time in pain, and whipped around, knocking Jake to the ground with a single swipe of its claws. Run, damn it, he shouted, coughing up blood. I hesitated for a heartbeat, torn between fighting and fleeing. But the look in Jake's eyes, desperate, pleading, made the choice for me. I ran. The sounds of the fight followed me as I tore through the woods, my flashlight bouncing wildly in my hand. I could hear Jake shouting, cursing, the wet sounds of flesh tearing. And then, nothing. No screams, no growls, just silence. My lungs burned, my legs felt like lead, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. I burst through the tree line, the cabin coming into view like a beacon. I scrambled up the porch steps, threw open the door and slammed it shut behind me, bolting it with trembling hands. Outside the forest was still, but I knew it wasn't over. I don't know how long I sat on the cabin floor, my back pressed against the door, the rifle clutched in my trembling hands. My breath came in shallow gasps, my chest heaving as I strained to hear any sound beyond the walls. Nothing. The silence was absolute, suffocating, but it didn't bring relief. If anything, it was worse, like the forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for whatever came next. I thought about Jake, about the last time I'd seen him, blood pouring from his chest as he faced that thing. I'd run like a coward, left him to die out there in the dark. And now his screams, or the lack of them, played on an endless loop in my head. The weight of his rifle, across my lap, felt unbearable. When the first light of dawn crept through the windows, I finally forced myself to move. Every muscle in my body ached, and my injured ankle throbbed with every step as I limped toward the porch. The woods looked different in the daylight, smaller somehow, the twisted shapes of the trees 
reduced to nothing more than bark and branches. But I knew better. I knew what was out there. Cooper's collar was still in my pocket, the blood dried and flaking. I ran my thumb over the worn leather, a hollow ache settling in my chest. I called for him, weakly at first, then louder, the sound echoing through the trees. But there was no answer. I didn't go looking for Jake. Not because I didn't want to, but because I knew it wouldn't matter. If he'd survived, he would have made it back to his cabin by now, and if he hadn't, well, there wouldn't be enough left of him to bury. Instead, I packed a bag, my own essentials only, and left the cabin behind. As I drove down the narrow dirt road toward town, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every shadow between the trees seemed to shift as I passed, and more than once, I thought I caught a glimpse of pale, mottled skin disappearing into the underbrush. I didn't stop. In the days that followed, I tried to tell myself it was over, that I was safe. I rented a room at the inn on the edge of town, a place with plenty of light and people nearby. I tried to explain what had happened to the sheriff, but he didn't believe me. Probably a bear, he said, like I knew he would. They've been getting bolder lately. I didn't argue. What would have been the point? But at night I still heard it. That wet guttural growl, low and distant, as if it were just beyond the edge of my dreams. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the echo of Jake's last words ringing in my ears. The last straw came a week later. I was loading up my truck, ready to head to my brother's place in the next state over, when I saw them, deep scratches raked across the driver's side door. They hadn't been there the night before. And caught in the handle was a tuft of wiry, pale hair. I didn't sleep that night. I didn't leave the room. But it didn't matter. The thing was letting me know it wasn't finished. I don't live in the mountains anymore. Hell, I don't even go near them. But every now and then, I'll see a headline. Local hiker missing in Appalachian wilderness. And I'll feel that familiar chill creep up my spine. Because I know what's out there. And I know it's still watching.